Greetings, YouTube. Today I'll be looking at the book Medieval Sieges and Siegecraft by Joffrey Hindley. Um, and it says, it does what it says on the tin. This is a book about medieval sieges and siegecraft. So if you're interested in the, in the politics and the strategy and the tactics involved in conducting a siege and surviving a siege, this book is for you. It doesn't go in as in great detail of the actual devices used in uh, sieges. It does go into some detail, but I have read references in the past that went into greater detail that were really into the nuts and bolts, if you'll forgive the pun, of the devices known as uh, siege weapons. Um, this book covers about the Dark Ages through the end of the Renaissance, roughly. So they actually go in where they go well into firearms, both into um, man portable and into cannon, mortar, things like that. Um, but they don't really get into the age of explosive ordnance, which didn't come into a little bit later. So it's you're firing solid shot, often even um, a stone solid shot. Um, this is uh, at the right, he takes the book right to the cusp to where they were beginning to use metal rounds, cast rounds, as opposed to um, one stone rounds that were made to fit the barrel of the weapon in question. Of course, that's another problem with some of the early cannons. They were all one-offs. Um, they were, and, and some of them were incredibly large. I mean, some of them could fire a stone that was, you know, two feet in diameter um, or larger. And uh, they often had you know, elaborate names and they were decorated and they were considered to be, uh, to have a great deal of personal connections to the, both the maker and the user. Sometimes they have a, had had a, a great deal of connection to the ethnicity or the nationality of the of the users of that particular siege weapon. So a weapon became known as you know that belonged to the X people, and, and you know it would be used against their foes and things like that. Of course, there was the whole um, Crusade era, which this book covers, um, dealing with. The conflicts between Muslim and Christians um, in the Middle East. And make no bones about it, uh, the Crusades were not how many people think of them as. They weren't this righteous desire to take back from the Holy Lands from Islam. Um, they were motivated by politics. There were a whole lot of extra bodies in Europe that the social structure really didn't want. When you've got a guy who has a title, and he's got three sons, only one of whom is going to get that title, you really don't want the other two to be sticking around at home trying to figure out how, how ways to how to bump off the eldest brother so one of them can take that shot. Conveniently, if you convince them to go to the Holy Lands and take it back for Christendom, and make a whole lot of money in the process, you've created a release valve for that social pressure. Yeah, I know there are people who don't think that's one of the reasons that the Crusades happened. I personally happen to think it does. I don't think that there, because ultimately the Christian desire to retake the Holy Lands failed miserably. Oh, if you look at the long game. Um, but the book does present both the victories of both Christians and Muslims in that conflict, and the atrocities committed by both Christians and Muslims in those conflicts. It does not paint either as being uh, particularly noble in, the, in their goals, though it does discuss the honor of individual uh, uh, warriors and of individual battles. Um, Suleiman the Magnificent, for example, was known for being uh, having a certain level of honor towards his enemies. Unfortunately, as, the, as one of the blurbs on the back of the book, the only blurb on the back of the book says, we're talking about when some an Islamic, uh, a Muslim force surrendered honorably their city to the Christians. They say, okay, well, yeah, we, we, we make a deal. You come in, you don't, we let us leave kind of thing. It says, they did not know that Christians rarely honored, uh, honored oaths pledged to unbelievers. Most of them were massacred. Yeah. And then there were the peoples, for example, that would rush into a keep or a walled city for protection because there's an army heading towards them and the people that were supposed to be defending them have already gone into the city or the keep, um, only to discover that uh, once the 
battle really begins to take place. People realize how long they're going to be here, and that these refugees from outside, <clears throat> they're not fighters. They were ne the, 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 the keep was never designed to hold these refugees. They're just driven out of the, out of the, the keep because their mouths to feed, they don't want to feed. And sometimes the enemy would let them pass through their ranks and escape, but sometimes the enemy wouldn't. And so now you have a group of civilians caught between a keep that won't, won't, won't let them in and an army that will kill them if they tried to get out. And they're stuck in the middle where they starve to death in full view of both armies. Yeah, there, there are no good guys in war. Uh, you can make a claim that in the long run, maybe that one poor side was, was less moral than the other, but when it comes to actual battles themselves, there are a lot of cases where both sides were equally awful. And this book does cover that, and I gotta tell you, it was depressing in that regard. But I did find the technical aspects of how the castles were designed, their, their mechanisms for defense, the, how the siege weapons and the siege towers were built and, and, and deployed. Um, there's one example, and a great example in here. Now, a siege tower was a large wooden structure uh, that had wheels on it, and we moved forward so that it would allow uh, attackers to get over the wall or on, on top of the wall. Uh, they would often be covered in leather um, animal hides that were soaked in water so that the, the defenders could not burn them. They would, you know, fire burning and whistle missiles and things at them, but they would fail because of the, the outer coating. Uh, at least that's the theory. And they had this one great tower that came to, that, to, to uh, a keep, and the people in the keep cleverly, though unconventionally, broke a hole in their own wall so they could attack the siege tower from the base. They succeeded in this. They set it alight, which was their goal. Unfortunately, the siege tower collapsed towards the wall. And it was an incredibly large siege tower. I mean, really immense. So it burned for a really long time, and it got really hot. Guess what happens when you heat stone really, up, really high, and then it cools? Yeah, the wall broke. So their goal to prevent their enemy from getting into the keep failed miserably as they helped them reach a hole in their own wall. I don't think your clever plan is going to turn out the way you thought it was. Cue a picture of a small child with a fork going toward the wall, a wall socket. Um, so there were some of those things in there which I, well, yes, there are people dying in the process, but I still find it somewhat humorous. I do have a dark sense of humor. Um, so I really recommend this book if you are a history buff, if you're a if you have an interest in middle, the Middle Ages, um, and if you are a gamer and would like to add a little bit of realism to your game as far as a siege is concerned, this is going to be a book that you're going to want to read. Obviously, you would have to compensate for the fact that many fantasy settings do possess magic. Magic really makes conventional sieges and, and, and siege defenses moot. Um, that, that's a problem. But... It's still interesting to see how things could go and how they could become useful to a, to a GM if they wanted to add a degree of realism to a low magic game. Because um, if you know if, if it is low magic, then essentially the mages are playing the same role as firearms are, cannons and such. And if you replace them, maybe you can actually still continue to pull off a conventional siege and siegecraft kind of an event. Um, so. Highly recommended. I, it was it was a little dry, but otherwise I, I enjoyed the book. Um, and the only foible I say that the guy had is that while he was not an outward misogynist or, or sexist, he definitely wasn't a feminist. That was kind of evident in his writing style when he was discussing women. Um, but he did treat them better than I have seen other historians to treat them. And I don't think that speaks well for many historians. <laughs>